we have an amazing guest, one of our power athletes out there. So we w- welcome Leo Rosa, a full-time firefighter up in the Seattle area and current Field Strong athlete. So you've been on that program for over five years and yep. you utilize it to be an asset to your brothers and sisters in the fire service, man. So welcome to Power Athlete Radio. We're glad to have you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Definitely a uh, long time following you guys, uh, listening to you guys, grabbing all the, the information and, and you know knowledge you guys have. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys and having a chat one-on-one. Well, it's crazy. This is the first time that we've ever sat like this, but uh, I feel like I know you because you tag me in everything and I get to see your that training is- daily, which is you know what we recommend on all the training programs. Like, please tag us because it allows me to drop in and see uh, the training you're doing. And so it's pretty cool. So it's, uh, I feel like we have a personal relationship in that I comment on stuff and we see it, but now it's kind of, it's strange that we end up developing friendships on social media and then you meet the person to person or two, I guess, person to person. It's really person to zoom, but yeah, we it's such an interesting reaction. had the opportunity to speak before the show yeah. and what a small world and that yeah. you were training at CrossFit Reston at the time that we were training Christy Adkins for the 2016 CrossFit Games and getting her back from uh, a bicep rupture. Mm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, crazy small world of that it's small world, man. It's, it's interaction. So right? Like this, yeah, this fitness industry, when you get to a certain level, it's, it's, it's dispersed, but it's still very connected, right? Like, you, you know, talking about you guys and the, the connection that we have kind of feels personal. Listening to the podcast for the past, you know, three, four years, it's almost like I know you guys too. It's not just the training and what I get through, you know, through the social media. It's like the podcast gives such a, a an intimate relationship just by listening to you guys and the guests that sitting here now, it's almost like I'm there with you guys in the studio talking, right? And I've had a relationship with you guys for so long. And my introduction with you was, I've actually seen you, Tex, across your rest and training Christy Phillips at the time, right? When she was training for the CrossFit Games. And that was my initial introduction to Power Athlete was seeing her train and you training her and how she trained on a daily basis coming in and going through her program. I always raise an eyebrow on my end. Like, huh, what is she doing? That seems fun. That seems different than your normal CrossFit programming, right? Because my introduction to fitness in general was my gateway drug was CrossFit. I started through CrossFit. I, I grew I grew on it. And then eventually I branched off just like you guys did into Power Athlete. When you guys had, you know, the, the Johnny Water CrossFit football, that's kind of how I started looking at it. And then Started training with Christy for a little while. And the next thing you know, boom, I jumped on with you guys. Once you guys branched off, I was like, no, I'm jumping ship and I'm going with that as well. And I've been with you guys for fuck, almost six years now, I think. And when did you join the, the fire service? About eight years ago, seven, eight years ago. So before that, had you had any experience lifting weights or training or really your introduction to fitness and lifting weights was through the fire academy? So I grew up very athletic. You know, I'm, I'm originally from Brazil. And in Brazil, you're going to go either into soccer or jiu-jitsu, right? Like I went right into jiu-jitsu. I did that for the longest time. When I was younger, I started skateboarding and skateboarded for nine years, then freestyle BMXing. So I was always very active, right? I was always doing these odd kind of sports, never really like structural, you know, play with a ball kind of sports, very odd and try to be athletic somewhat in them because they, they require a certain level of athleticism. And then when I was about 19, 20, I started actually working out, trying to go. I had a bar and some dips, and I started doing that. Just like some calisthenics, but, you know, body weight stuff with my friends. Eventually started, you know, moved to the U.S., and here I joined a global gym, would go in, do your, your normal, you know, buys and tries, chest and back. But I had no idea what I was doing. I had no structure whatsoever. Eventually, I started working for a company that had the owner actually did CrossFit, and I was just a gym bro, and he was jacked. I was like, dude, like, what do you do? He goes, oh, I go to CrossFit. I was like, what the hell is, what the hell is CrossFit? And he's like, oh, come check it out. So I went in, did like a, a, a trial day, like an introduction session, whatever you want to call it, right? Your first day. And I remember the workout being called 400 Meters of Death. And it was a Sounds 45 about right. pound, yeah, 45, 45 pound implement over your head. You got to lunge 400 meters with it. Every time you drop the implement, you got to run the 400 back to the implement until you complete a 400 meter lunge you know, around the track. I, I probably ran 30 mouth. miles that day. I probably, I just, I just <laughs> threw up in my mouth a little bit. That's yeah. the fucking worst thing I've ever heard. Uh, and was, you went, came back the next day. Like, I don't understand. Well, it's, I it's was immediately the, uh, sold. Yeah. It's, it's like, <laughs> I suck at this so bad. I bet you if I keep coming, maybe I won't suck nearly as bad as kind of the mindset. At least I took with CrossFit where it was just so bad. I'm like, it can't be this bad tomorrow. Let me show up tomorrow. And it was a little less worse. You and then the next day, and this. the next day, yeah. 
<laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, dude. I, uh, the first workout I ever did was fight gone bad at the CrossFit, um, seminar at, uh, at the level one it was really my first CrossFit workout and it was fucking terrible. Awful. I think everybody. Where are you I from in Brazil? A city called Belo Horizonte. Where, uh, is that down South? It's Southeast. So if you're familiar with like Brazil, like you know where Sao Paulo? Yeah, no, I, I, I went, uh, we did a month in Brazil. I was yeah. in, um, during Carnival, we were in Bahia in the North and then we went to, yeah. uh, Rio and then we ended up in Florianopolis. So Rio is in between Bahia and Florianopolis, right? So if you get Rio on the coast and you have Sao Paulo, which is like mm -hmm. the biggest city there, like our yeah. New York, and you triangulate that inland, it's, it's my city. Yeah. How'd you, how'd you end up in Seattle? I, when I originally moved from, from Brazil, I landed in Miami. Miami was kind of like, you know, the, the, the but, easiest spot to go to is kind of like, <laughs> it's, it, <laughs> if you're from South America, you end up from in Miami. Oh, because it's, it. yeah, it's, it's, it's basically you roll South your American. Boat to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's really you South America. Boat, you land right in Miami. <laughs> So it's like a, it's like a, a nice South America. I landed there. Yeah. I'm like, there's not much different. It's just, it looks different, but everybody's the same. Yeah. Uh, and then from there I moved to DC. I was in the DC area. That's where I, you know, cross the rest and the whole Virginia, Northern Virginia area. I just hated DC man. I hated that area. And, uh, I, I loved my job. I started my fire service career there, but I, I just did not like the area at all. Uh, I came to visit a couple of friends of mine in the Portland area, fell in love with the Pacific Northwest, decided I wanted to move here. And I just started making the moves and eventually I landed in Portland. And from Portland, I got a job where I'm at now, which is next to Seattle. And it just made sense to live closer to Seattle, closer to work. And that's the department that I'm at now and that I will retire at. So I'll be here for the long haul. I love this area. I was going to say, when you said that you saved the mustache because it's too hot, I'm like, aren't you in the Pacific Northwest where it's, I mean, we live in Texas where it's, it's hot like Brazil. Yeah, it's hot. I was down there a couple of months ago and it's burning hot. And you led to the path of performance. And that's yes. that's where we want to take this conversation. Yes. Because you were a firefighter, you had CrossFit, and then you realized the gap in your performance. So speak yeah. to us about the demands of a firefighter that you must yeah. train for. So doesn't matter how you cut the job of a fireman, it, it's a blue collar job. Right. Like we, we work with our hands. Every aspect of our career, of, of our job has some kind of physical demand to it. Whether you're doing, you know, an actual fire where you're wearing, you know, bunker coat and you're hot and you're wearing all this gear and you're 60, 70, 80 pounds heavier than your normal body weight. There's a physical demand to that. It can be from that capacity to you're breaking the door of a car to extract somebody from that vehicle to where you're in a trench rescue and you got to rappel down and bring up, you know, a, a victim up or you're doing, you're picking up old Miss Smith from the floor and she's in an awkward position. It demands some sort of physical capacity from the responder, right? So everything that we do has a physical capacity to it, right? So there's a demand, a physical demand from day one to day, whatever 25 years is from that day, right? So to the end of your career, you're going to be physically challenged and physically, you got to be physically ready for whatever the day brings to you. Because it, re it is really, a, I don't know what the day is going to bring to me. I can have calls that are as simple as picking up, you know, getting a cat off the tree and helping Miss Smith across the road to a huge fire with victims. I got to throw ladders up in the building. I got to climb ladders. I got to extract victims from, uh, you know, a, a balcony or there's a car that is flipped and I got to stabilize this vehicle and I have to do all these physical demands. So it's such a broad spectrum of the physical capacities that we need to have, right? They, that's where the training comes in hand. Yeah, you know, was so that's where the was there ever a moment in training for specifically the the fire academy or experience on the job where you felt deficient? You felt you couldn't perform and needed to invest more in your preparation. Yeah, I think we always we always there's always that self assessment at the end of whether it's a drill or uh, you know the academy itself or a call anything that you you finish any task that you finish there's a self-assessment at the end right it's like where did i lack did i lack on the skills did i lack on knowledge or did i lack on the physical capacity to perform the job right there has always been that assessment throughout you know my career and i think in the very beginning of my career i didn't have the the, the training that i have now that i've been with you guys for so long i was more like i said just fit generally physically fit and i had a lot of traits to myself but nothing specific and I think I lacked a lot on the cardio aspect of things. I didn't know how to train for those, those longer duration calls or events that I would have to put myself through. So I had to focus a little bit more on that, 
right? So that is not necessarily cardio. It's more of an endurance aspect. It's like that muscle endurance. It's like I'm going to be here doing this repetitive task for a long period of time. And my ability to perform that would deteriorate through that longevity of the time. And I felt that in the beginning. And I had to focus on that. Like, uh, I'm going to put a fire, for example. In you know, let's say fire, you have a fire hose and you're going to be fighting this fire, quote unquote, fighting a fire for 15 minutes until this fire go out. Okay. And you're going to be flowing water, which is heavy. The hose is heavy. It, it fights back with you, but you need to have that endurance to provide that service for 15 minutes straight. And you don't want to be the guy that says, I can't do it. I need to tag out. Somebody needs to come, you know, and grab this hose because I cannot handle it for 15 minutes. You want to be able to be there for the longevity of time because they're counting on you to do so. They test you to for that task and you, you need to be able to perform it for that time. And I felt like I was lacking that in the beginning. And that's not and that that's a very bad place to, to be and a bad, bad feeling to have to not be able to accomplish those long tasks. Right. You don't want to be the guy tapping out. How much uh, like a uh, mission specific training are you doing? I mean, obviously you do field strong, which is, uh, you know, more of an athletic style of training than some of the other programs. But, um, you know, in terms of building that big capacity that you're going to need to kick in the door, I mean, how much um, like in kit, you know, uh, you know, with your hood on and mask and like respirator, I mean, how much in like, like training in that kind of uh, specific domain mm -hmm. are you doing? Okay. Uh so the, the beauty of a field strong is that it gets you generally ready. It gets you, you know, it gets me that that GPP for my job, right? And I want that. I want to be ready for everything. So it doesn't matter what comes my way. When it comes to specific training, our department here is very heavy on drills. We drill constantly. So every day we're going to do two, three, four drills a day. And those drills are going to be specific to a scenario or a task that we, we put together. Right. And those drills are going to be fully bunked on oxygen, on, on air. You're going to be breathing air. You're going to be bunked. You're going to be simulating. You're not going to have the actual fire. So you can't simulate the temperature, you know, that you're going to be fighting against. But you can simulate everything else in between. Right. You can put your bunks on. You're going to get sweaty. You're going to get tired. And we're going to repeat that three or four times until you're completely depleted. You can perform, but now you have to perform. It's like, where do you draw the, you know, where are you going to draw that, that energy from? Where are you gonna what are you gonna rely on to be able to perform when your body and your mind can't don't want to? So we do that very constantly here. We push our limits very often here. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the specific training comes in. You know, I don't necessarily go out, out of my way on the days off and come to the station, put my gear on and drill. But when we're here, we make sure that we are drilling, we're training constantly. We're trying to stay ready for whatever comes, no matter the unknown, right? No, I mean, it, um, it, it makes a ton of sense. I mean, I have, um, the one thing I always worry a little bit about the firefighters and we've worked with, uh, you know, had firefighters and especially people that have trained them on the podcast. Um, there's always, uh, issues with like, you know, um, heart attacks and some, you know, some respiratory yeah. issues. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty interesting that if you stay in shape and you're continuing to do that training, I just yeah. wonder if, uh, you know, because you guys are in an urban environment and these are real problems. I wonder if maybe some departments don't do that amount of actual specific training because I mean, shit, that's just extremely taxing being underneath the oxygen, being in yeah. full gear, being able to run through that stuff. So to be able to have that base of training to be able to build upon, would you say that the, uh, the most of the firefighters that you've encountered are doing something in supplement to that training? John, I'll, I'll love to say yes. I'll love to, to give you, you know, a yes answer on that, but it's, it's not the, the reality of it, unfortunately. Uh, I think, you know, the saying that complacency kills is very true. And in our job, in the, in the career, I think not just firefighters, but PD, you're going to hear across the board, military, anybody that is some sort of responder, some sort of, you know, that, that community, complacency comes in very quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, in the beginning, once you, when, when, you want, when you first start the job, you're gun hold, you're, you're trying to get after it. So you want to show your best side, your, your best shape. Academy is very physically demanding. So when you go through academy, you're on top of your game, you're getting after it every day, you're doing all these drills. Probation year, same thing. You want to be, you know, kind of like the, the guy, you, you want to do everything. Those five years come in, those 10 years come in, the career, right? The, the, those longer years start coming in, that recliner starts looking a lot more comfortable than being on gear drilling on the drill ground. Yeah. Uh, and that's where the complicity kills comes. And, you know, I see it in my department, I see in every department that I've been around that I've worked at, 
is that you're, you're going to have the majority of people that don't drill, don't train, get fat, get out of shape, eat like shit. It's here too. Even though we push fitness, health, wellness, all those those values, the majority of people, especially like the old school guys, it's you can't hammer the nail on the head enough. The nail at some point is going to bend and it's just not going to go in. And they just choose to stay complacent and to stay, you know, that's just the culture they have. Mm -hmm. So being a younger guy and I'm a part of the peer fitness program that we have is trying to change that culture. It's trying to change, you know, show the importance of eating well, training hard, trying to stay ready, because it doesn't matter if it's day one or the last day of your career, that one call can still come, can still happen, mm -hmm. right? It, it's not, you don't know what you're going to get any given day. You can have a day here that is, you're sitting around with your finger up your butt, not doing anything. Just you go to a drill, you cook chili, you hang out, you shoot the shit with the boys. <laughs> and the other days, and that, and no, he does listen to the podcast. That's yeah. good. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, uh, so one of my good friends, uh, from high school, guy I play, uh, I play D tech, we play DN, guy named Keith Harder. Uh, Keith's dad, uh, was a fire chief. And then when he played football at San Luis Obispo, now he's a fire chief and got into the fire department really early. And, uh, that was a joke that, like, you know, like, what, what do they do? And he's like, I don't know. We do a lot of chili cook offs. So it was just kind of this joke that, uh, um, you know, cause like they would always have like different charity events or something. And it was just kind of this joke. So every time I make that crack about like, you know, having a good chili cook off, it's just kind of a personal joke. With get, a, get a firefighter and, in there and yeah. calendars. Yeah. Well, those guys are usually pretty good cooks. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I mean, as you guys know, if you listen to the podcast, uh, I'm a big fan of cooking and I think it's one of those skills that every dude should have. And I remember my mom, uh, when I was like maybe four or five years old. I was my mom's uh, assistant sous chef. Like I cooked, I yeah. cut everything and I helped her. And I actually learned to cook by, you know, cooking with my mom. And uh, it's something that's super important to me. So whenever I meet dudes that don't cook, I'm like, wow, I didn't know this existed. But yeah, yeah I mean, I know if you're in the fire department, you got to be able to cook. You got to be able to cook. That's the one thing probation. Like if you're, if you're a bad cook, don't let you go. <laughs> don't don't job don't mess up a meal in probation yeah. Yeah. yeah well i mean dude i mean especially you've been working all day and this is what you do i mean it's nice to come home and or more importantly have somebody cook a nice meal and sit down and be like good you put in the effort to do a good job which is so it's nice and, it, and it's yeah we, we can cook and you, you know you put eight guys in the kitchen something something interesting is going to come out of it yeah well yeah. do uh do, do they give you a tap down on any of the brazilian stuff any like uh pala de queijo or any like the good stuff or yeah uh, so yeah. pão de queijo is actually it's like you know cheese bread for yeah the, I, I do uh, my weakness in Brazil when we went was uh, palo de queijo and uh, and uh, chimichurri and we would look yeah. for like pork cow and any like the Brazilian steakhouses yeah and we're literally just crush it I basically we were eating like one meal a day and I was drinking coffee for the rest of the days at all those like yeah, little but the like, one corners. meal is like this big yeah. 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 Well, dude, every corner in Brazil has like a little, or in Rio has like a little corner, like uh, seats, like place you go and they serve like acai bowls and all that. And then just like nuclear coffee. So we would just do that and then go to Brazilian steakhouses. Yep. That sounds, sounds about right. And I loved it. It's interesting because Leo, you're on field strong, you gravitate yeah. towards it and you have intent and passion and can see yeah. the connection between where you need it. We also yeah. offer opportunity through online training with our hammer program yeah. that when people blindly reach out yeah. and then we ask their profession and they say fire, we direct them towards hammer. So yeah. John speak to us because you are the most well, familiar with well, the difference between these two yeah. and you see the connection of what Leo's using feel strong for what is well, hammer for those that are un unaware. So the reason Leo is using field strong is because he likes to Olympic lift. And I know this cause he tags me in like all the Olympic movements. So yeah. likes to front squat, likes to do the Olympic lifts, likes the plyos. So hammer tends to use less Olympic movements. And if we do, it's more of a, a dynamic pull with, we'll either use a landmine or some dumbbells. So I don't really put a ton of Olympic lifting, like stanch clean and jerks, power movements, like we do in field strong. Uh, and then it's obviously has a little bit more dedicated run template, whereas field strong is going to be more on the sprint side. Uh, just because um, if we're trying to write a generalist program, I think for most of the fire guys, they need to be able to put a little bit more mileage if they're not getting it. Because yeah. what I'm, I'm a little worried about is that it's not like Leo where they're showing up and doing some form of in-kit training every single day. So I'm trying to make up a little bit for that because that was one of the complaints. Like, hey, we're not getting enough, um, uh, you know, aerobic capacity, kind of that type of run. Well, they, they felt they weren't. And then how Leo used the term GPP. Now, to paint the picture of where GPP falls into the Field Strong program is we don't 
schedule a specific block of conditioning each day, similar to a uh, old school CrossFit where mm-hmm. you had a strength workout of the day and then a daily workout of the day. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But how Field Strong is set up, imagine it's 75 dedicated minutes yep. and you're moving. So it's, right. it's not checking your clock. It's not checking your phone. It's you're moving. You got work to do. And it's very similar to the experience of a sport practice or, as Leo described, being on the job where I got to be on for anywhere from 15 to 90 minutes. So it's generally prepared if I'm moving and shaking. And then we have hammer for the folks that are coming to us. And But the biggest thing is you're training with intent. You're going to start to see carryover. If you're just yogging miles and pounding pavement, of course you're not going to get enough cardio for your job. Well, uh, and Hammer's broken into similar strength veins in that there's obviously going to be some form of strength workout. Yes, and then yes, I yes. have uh, what I guess would be dubbed maybe more conditioning type, what I call capacity, where we're trying to get as many reps within a given time domain. Um, yeah. And, and there'll it, be different capacity pieces. So it has strength and capacity. We obviously have a sprint day on Monday. Uh, we're going to do some recovery, what I call easy effort, which is about building that aerobic base, which I don't know if people understand the significant of really that zone two to um, big, big capacity. And then obviously there's going to be some form of longer movement on Fridays, which either be a longer run, longer ruck. Um, we have a guy who's doing swimming. I got another guy whose you know, knees are too banged up because he's a, sh- he's a fire guy. So now he's just doing heavy rucks for 30 minutes. So it's really about just being able to go long, go fast and go hard for a given amount of time. Yeah. So my ex- I don't have a lot of experience with hammer. Like uh, I was literally talking to one of our guys here that is a power athlete guy and he does hammer. My friend Matt and Matt is uh, he showed me on Train Heroic the template of the program. He showed me the you know this week, this week, just so I could have an idea. And it's exactly what he said. It has tempo runs in there and you know the, the exact template. And for him in particular, he's a little bit older, he's 48, he's coming back from a shoulder injury. And he's saying that by far throughout his career is probably one of the best preparations he had, that he has had to come back to the job and stay ready for the job. He is in absolute love with it. You know, and he's talked to plenty of people in our peer fitness group about power athlete, about hammer, about field strong for the guys and girls that are more gun hold, they're more, you know, they have more capacity to give. Yeah. Right. I have one of our girls here, one of our Maddox, Danny. She does, I got her to do feel strong with me. So she does feel strong with me. So every night then we text each other, like, hey, what did you get on this? What are you doing on this? Like on the program, on the temple of the week, and we try to get sessions together. So hammer is from everything that I've heard and I've seen, is unbelievably capable of preparing and keeping firefighters and first responders ready for what the days bring, right? Well, Beyond- that's why we have different options. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I know Louis, like it's, uh, I just don't have the econ. like, so when I program, uh, there's an idea of like economy of time, maximal return for minimal input. So you're constantly looking at like, all right, uh, I would rather have somebody give me a hard 15 minutes here than give me a sloppy 45. And so I know with like a lot of the Olympic movements, I know that there's going to be a higher barrier to entrance. So I look for things like uh, rotational landmine power cleans. I'll do, uh, you know, single arm dumbbell power, you know, uh, hang clean to push press. And so other movements that aren't as technically demanding. Whereas if I ask Leo to, hey, you know what, we're going to, you know, power snatch, power clean, push jerk. I mean, with the barbells becomes more technical movements. So there is a higher barrier to entrance. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and then also for some of the older athletes that might not have the stability or the flexibility or really that time to develop um you know you're looking at the economy of time how do i get these guys going 100 miles an hour with movements that they can execute with full intensity and be smart in terms of the volume and not try to just fucking hang you know ornaments on a christmas tree are you allowed to train on shift because the oh, yeah. the only understanding of fire that i have is from the documentary backdraft <laughs> i mean isn't that all you I'm, I'm glad you called it a documentary first of all I, I, it's, it's that. I do love I picked that up on that. It's exactly what it is. So you get to train, like you save your training for when you show up that day. Can it be interrupted by calls or you train outside yeah. of the, the hours so, you're going to you know, be on? We, we, we have, we don't have allocated times to train. We can't just go off shift, like, you know, uh, unavailable to train. Uh, we have phenomenal gyms at our stations. We have 14 stations. We have a very strong peer fitness team. So everything is outfitted by Rogue. You know, we have very, very good equipment, right? We have all of our ergs. We have ski ergs, bike ergs, rowers, JHDs, all rope kettlebells. So our equipment is awesome. So we have a very solid gyms here. Uh, I got to play very carefully with the Field Strong program 
coming into shift because I can't either text myself too much, right? I can't do a very hard session and then I get interrupted to a call and I get to the call and now I, I, I've spent all my training bandwidth, my strength at the gym, and I don't have anything to give. And I'm going to be this really strong fit guy that cannot perform. So I got to be careful with how I train. I got to kind of go through the days, so feel strong, go through the week, say, all right, I'm going to be on shift on Tuesday. It's usually like a push, maybe a pull day is more of an upper body day. I can do that. I won't be that text that day. But if it's a, like a Monday where it's like a heavy squat day or something more technical or that is going to take a lot of energy out of me that, you know, my body's going to take more to recover. A lot of times I'm not going to do that day at work because I don't have enough time to recover. And most times I don't even have the time to build up to my numbers before I get interrupted by a call. Mm -hmm. You know, on a squat day, if I'm in the mid fours for my squats, it takes a while to warm up and build up to those numbers. By the time I get to the working sets, I get a call. And if I come back from that call an hour later, you got to warm up again. I've got to warm up again. That's just not happening. You know, mm -hmm. that, that session is basically done is a wash. And I just feel like I don't want to waste energy and, and, you know, training bandwidth for that. So I just got to be careful with my training days at work, but I do train quite often at work. Usually if you don't find me in the kitchen or in the drill ground, you know where to find me. I'm going to be in the gym. I'm, I'm known already here in the department. I'm like, all right, he was going to go hide in the gym for the next couple of hours if you, until we get a call. Right. I'm there trying to, you know, make up some of my days on feel strong or either doing some other accessory work or something. So I get to train a lot of work. And then obviously on the drill ground, I count that as training. It's, that is physically demanding. It's taxing. It takes out of you as well. Is a is a physical deposit in the bank, deposit in the bank. Right. Right on. I got yeah. I got one more question for you. And this yeah. this is something that I can't necessarily wrap my head around, but. How do you mentally prepare for this? So like there's a term that CrossFit threw around preparing you for the unknown and unknowable. And that is fire to me. Like you show up, you don't know what the hell's going to go on. And there's this burning building. You don't know who or what is in there. And you got to muster up the balls to just sprint in there yeah. and do it. Like speak to us to, about that. So, you know, you, you sent me the questions beforehand. So I was kind of doing a little bit of brainstorming on that one. And it's, there's this term courage, right? That people use that we're courageous, we're, we're brave and all of that. And they, they picture the firefighter with a, with a cape and a big ass on their chest. And courage is not really what we, we rely on. Because running into a burning building, doing this, you know, running to a, a car wreck or whatever chaotic scenario you can picture is what we want to do. We got into this career because we want to do that. We we thrive. We wait for that moment. And like we have like an adrenaline rush when you, we see a fire. We hear the fire that's confirmed or a big vehicle crash. Obviously, we don't want that because people are, you know, people are getting hurt and it's somebody's bad, bad day. But we want that. We want to be in those scenarios. We want to dive headfirst into those things. And when you come to the psychological side of it, it's relying on your training and focusing on the tasks. You don't focus on the scene. You don't focus on what's in front of you necessarily, like the big picture, right? Like you kind of focus on the task at hand. And once you're focused on the task, every, all the noise around you kind of goes away. You know, if you have to rescue somebody, if you got to throw a ladder, like I said, if you got if you got to be on the roof of a building of a house to cut a hole, you don't you don't look at yourself as like, oh my god, I'm in this big fire. I mean, this thing's gonna collapse on me. All these bad negative things that can possibly happen. You focus on. I got to cut the hole. I got to focus on my drill, on my training, on the on what I know that I got to do right now. So that carries you psychologically into a lot of the, the, the tasks that you've got to perform. And the other thing that it drives me a lot into my calls is the idea that we are the last resort of people. If they called us, if we're showing up, it's because everything that they could do or they could or they knew how to do didn't work. We're their last chance or their last call to help and save and possibly improve whatever they're going through. When you know that there's nothing beyond you, we can't call anybody. We're it. So when you know that you don't have somebody else to call, another another uh, agency to call, that, that mindset goes into like, all right, I'm it. I'm on the hot seat. I, I have to perform no matter what happens. I got to be the one to solve this problem for this person. And and, and also it's different. Uh, I mean, you might go into a fire, you might go into somebody where a uh, you know, building collapses, car accident, uh, yeah. heart attack. I mean, it feels like the skill set is very uh, diverse. 
where it's you're going to go into a situation and you don't necessarily know what's you're presented with. And then you have to be able to make a decision. Do I have the tools? Do I have the knowledge? Do we have yeah. the right people? Can we solve this problem? I mean, it's, uh, it's something I never really thought about. Like, you know, there's nobody else to call. It's us. And it's we're going to have to, if they call us and we show up, we're going to have to fix or solve this problem. That's a, um, that's a pretty good one. And that's why we drill so much in the, the ability to be calm under stress, right? And you're going to hear that through the military PD, like I said, all the, our, our, our community is nobody on the radio is ever going to sound desperate. There's always that time to breathe. You go through the Rolodex of cards that you have in your head of skills and what is this going to require and you start pulling those cards. And if you don't have the cards, you rely on your partners, on your coworkers and the, the, the other uh, specialties that you have in the fire service to assist. If I don't know if it's a hazmat call and I don't have the tools, I'm not going to be desperate and say, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I don't know. What do I do here? No, you calm down, you take a breather. All right. Hey guys, I need a hazmat team here to come and do what you guys do. So it's to be calm under that stress. And it is really tax the unknown and unknowable. That's a fin that's a the perfect way to put it. You never know what you're gonna get. It's a box of chocolates. Right? Uh, yeah, we had yeah. um uh who who did we have on? We had Annette Zap. Yeah we had Annette She's Zap coming on. back. Oh so we had a uh, Annette Zap on who works uh, a lot within like the mental emotional health within firefighters yeah. and gave us a really um, chilling view of like, you know, uh, the reason that a ton of firefighters end up becoming alcoholics and dealing with yeah. this is just the, the ugliness you see on a daily basis yeah. and uh, not having the tools in place to deal with it. Um, the one tool that uh, helps people somehow be more resilient is a high level of fitness and strength and training that the people that end up going hard and making sure that, you know, everything is a hundred percent in terms of, you know, strength capacity, like all the things that we're, you know, expounding on this podcast yeah. tend to be more resilient in those situations and maybe not have the same, you know, uh, you know, dive into the bottle to deal with these problems because they <laughs> yeah. have an outlet. But that was a, a really scary podcast for the fact that I didn't know the amount of suicides and the amount of deaths associated with yeah. it. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I mean, suicide's such a, an interest. I mean, I, I was just, you know, uh, Crispy just posted a deal on like the amount of veteran suicides yeah. in relationship to people that passed away in 20 years in the Iraq deal. And I was like, my head almost exploded. So yeah. I mean, this is a very real problem. And I mean, you know, we're asking people to go into these situations and the ugliness they see and then not giving them um, the, the tools to deal with it after the fact, uh, you know, feels like a hell of a problem. But I mean, you know, as she said, you know, the, the people that tend to dive into fitness and be fitter and stronger and have that training deal tend to be more resilient. It is. Fitness is a therapy. You know, fitness is a way of therapy. It is, a, a for lack of a better word, a coping mechanism as well, yeah. because you can find comfort in the bottom of a bottle or you can find comfort, you know, letting it all out in the, in the gym floor. Or the bottom of a squat. I mean, the bottom of a the squat, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's, I mean, it's true. I mean, this happens to me. I don't know about you guys, but I miss a workout and like, I'm fucking completely upset with myself about it where I'm like, God, I can't believe I fucking missed that workout. I'm such a fucking lazy ass. And, uh, you know, I have options. Like obviously I gotta take the dog's walk or I'll jump on the bike or I try to do something. You mean joy choices, but yeah. go on. But I mean, the fact that, uh, the building for us with weights is at the top of the hill and I look out my window at it and it's like, oh fuck, the fortress of solitude is giving me dirty looks. And so I, I, I can imagine you know, I mean, as a, as an NFL player, um, you know, training was integral to the job because, you know, what you did in the weight room and in the training environment translated onto the field, uh, you know, same for you guys. That's, yeah. that's, that's the point I was trying to picture, like yeah. on a football field, a lacrosse field, there is not an infinite amount of possibilities. It's mm -hmm. set plays execute where athletic, amazing things do happen within the realm. I know the domains, I know the arena. I know the sport. I know I can react if something athletic happens, mm -hmm. but like shit, man, just, just, I can't grasp it. And that's why hats off to like military fire police, yeah. even speaking with Cali. Holy shit. Like I could never be a cop, but that's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, holy shit, man. Well, and I thank uh, you and uh, glad you find value in power athlete training to help you 100%. do what you got to do. Well, the, I'm, I'm sure we could do an entire podcast with Leo basically on the, ridiculous things that he encounters on a daily basis, which is one of my favorite. Lots things. of dicks. When, <laughs> whenever I talk to Callie, like the lots um, of dicks, uh, uh, the amount of ridiculousness that she encounters, she should chronicle like the amount. I mean, I, I can't imagine 
uh, you know, I mean, I, uh, one of the funnier stories, I remember my buddy in the fire department, he said, he, you know, he's had numerous people call them with heart attacks and they show up with heartburn. Like I'm having a heart oh, attack. Yeah. And they're like, no, 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 you're not having a heart attack. You're having heartburn. Why did you call us? Why don't you go to the hospital? And like people not realizing that the fire department is not their personal, personal medical service uh -huh. coming to like get them in assets. I mean, I, that we have plenty of those, you know, that those come, the, the funny calls like that, they come a lot, like the BS calls, right? And we have the whole spectrum, man, of BS to funny calls to a story for later on to 10 years from now, I'm going to be talking about the story and having fun and laughing about it to the, to the, you know, high acuity, just going to linger. I need to flush this out of my system type of call, yeah. right? So you have the whole spectrum. And from the first, from the funny ones to the, the last one to the high acuity ones, we try to find humor in them. That's why we have such dark sense of humor. We'll find a way to make that story funny. We'll find yeah. a way to make that a, a, something we can talk about and crack a joke and still have fun and try to lighten the mood for everybody. So every story is going to turn into some sort of funny, you know, talking point at the, at the table at some point. But yeah, stories are planning. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, uh... It's a very needed job and, a, and an ugly one. So, man, I really appreciate you uh, doing the job for us and then also being able to use the training. Uh, I feel like we're contributing in some way to, to helping the cause and preparing you guys to go out and face the unknown and the unknowable, to quote Greg Glassman in the CrossFit, which I, uh, there's so many douchey <laughs> fucking CrossFit sayings that when I say them out loud, I cringe but actually are so fucking make sense. I know. Kind of like, sense. Uh, like preparing for the unknown and unknowable. And they like, they like curb stomp these things to the point of like ridiculousness where you hear them and you're like, oh, you roll your eyes, but it's true. I mean, you know, for a job like he has, he doesn't know what he's going to encounter. Like as soon as the bell rings and you run and you, you know, you get in the truck and you're going to someplace, you don't know what you're going to encounter. You, you don't it know. A, and it could be a riot. Weekend, it could be a gunshot. It could be a fire. It could be a collapse. It could be anything. It and could the be a fire. gives you a very, very, hollow idea of what you're going into the scene can change it's very organic it changes on you in the blink of an eye you know and we can harp on crossfit all day long i know we, we you know you and i are both are going to have disagreements on crossfit and the methodology and if you talk about oh preparing for the unknown and unknowable you're talking about these crossfit games athletes that are going in they don't know what the workout's going to be yeah. right so that's the one but you thing. know it's going to be a barbell and you're going to have to do you're something gonna, you know it's going to be some sweaty. sort of jungle jimmy you're going to be yeah. you know doing some sort of jumping around flipping something new that they're going to throw at you and that's one aspect of CrossFit that we can be like, ah, that's BS. But then when you apply it to what I do and what my community does, we're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Because we're really getting ready for the unknown and unknowable. Yeah. But to a whole different capacity than just a workout, a bro out session at the gym. It comes well, down to. I, I always thought for the CrossFit home. gym, I, I always thought for the CrossFit games that they should have had like uh, be able to execute CPR. And they, they should have had some swim recovery where you actually had to save a person. No, they tried to do that, John. Just nobody collapsed and nobody drowned. <laughs> so it was in there. It just it just didn't happen. They weren't working hard enough. Uh, well, now okay. they're wrenching off to the tactical games, right? That's kind of where you have yeah. now. It's kind of yeah. tactical games. Now it's kind of going towards that route. You know, it's kind of like a, a bland, a hybrid of, you know, functional fitness, CrossFit into, you know, shooting, doing all these, you know, tactical movements and performances of uh, skill performances. Yeah, right? but what... We're yeah. field strong, specifically yeah. targets. And John's got more experience with the hammer, but we're field strong. It is those moments of yes. explosivity, power, and athleticism. And we're aiming to increase that and then your ability to replicate it to where I guess the, the experience with CrossFit in which we're speaking is this cyclical, monotonous economy where uh -huh. I can suffer versus yeah. the moment where sport field strong expressed in moments that's where i see the the value that that leo's taken from it so 100%. when when um when glassman uh, originally reached out to me with crossfit and i had the opportunity to go hang with him the way crossfit was explained to me made a lot more sense than what i see today for where it's gone yeah um, in terms of the game and whatnot like there was this idea of like develop all these skills develop base level capacity and then go learn and execute new sports so you know use it as like you know this this transition into something greater you know, find a use for it. And then it got into this self-perpetuating, you know, you're training to train and the daily workout is your competition, which was never the original intent. Yeah. So, I mean, the way Leo's using it where it's like, Hey, you know what? I found the style well, of training that allows me to be, which is what I believe we've stayed true for, you know, the entirety of, uh, you know, the first day when, you know, CrossFit football was suggested to me 
was the idea of, and I, and I think it's because of where I came from. Mm -hmm. Like nobody was paying me for what I got to bench press. Nobody was paying me to do execute what I did in the gym. It was, that was the sharpening of the blade that allowed me to go out and be successful on the field. So yeah. I viewed training in the same way where it's like, you know, you can train to train, but at the end of the day, it's much more meaningful and rich experience if you can actually use it in cool ways, like the way Leo's using it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so yeah. this is you the shit that gets your... me excited where I hear about like, Hey, you know what? Like the reason I know Leo's a firefighter and he tags me and stuff and I see him executing it. It's great that he's doing it, but I know he's using it for a greater purpose, which is that we can't you know, see on Instagram. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, like the call fucking goes and he's out like a shot and, uh, you know, he's able to do all the things. And if he wasn't, he wouldn't fucking have followed us for five or six years. So the fact that I see him yeah. coming in day in and day out, isn't because you know, uh, you know, the sh for whatever reason, but it's, it's because the training is translating into what he needs it to do, which at the end of the day is the most important part. And he it. knows it. I'll leave you, I'll leave you guys with this. Okay. I know we're, we're getting short on time past our time frame. So the goal that I have every day at work is to make sure I come back home at the end of a shift is to make sure that my, the people, my brothers and sisters here go back home. So make sure that everybody's safe, including us and the community that we serve. But I want to go home at the end of the day. Okay. For me to go home, I got to be ready. I got to be able to perform at, those, at, my, at my job to the best of my capacity. And all my coworkers need to be able to perform as well. I need to rely on them. And I want to make sure that they rely on me. So I want to be an asset to my team. For me to be an asset, I got to be physically capable, ready, strong, fast to be able to do my job. A lot of times, I, and I'll tell you this, I've been following you guys for five years now. The fact that I'm able to go home every night has a direct correlation with my training, with what you guys have been able to provide to me through Feel Strong. My training through Feel Strong and the, my physical capacities and abilities are what guarantee me to be an asset, to have people rely on me, and that I get to go home at the end of every shift. Because... I don't know, but I, I'm pretty sure there has been calls and moments that if I wasn't as physically ready and fit and strong and fast, it would have not gone the way it went. It would have not mm -hmm. gone positive how it went. Something could have possibly happened if I wasn't as fast and as strong and as fit that would have hindered me to not go home or the guy and girl next to me to not go home. So that is where I take from Feel Strong in you guys is the mindset of being ready and it's the trust that I have on myself and the training that you guys provide that I'll be able to always be ready and an asset to my team and to the community that I serve. So the goal is to always go home. And if I was doing some bullshit training from somebody else that is some jerk off sessions at the gym that are not going to get me anywhere, that are just going to be working out for working out just for the sake of doing some BS moving, movements and getting a pump and looking good. I wouldn't go home at the end of every shift. I would not be here talking to you guys right now because I'll probably not be home. You understand where I'm getting at? Yeah. So the training, the mindset, and the physical capacity that I have right now to be able to be an asset and go home is directly related to feel strong and you guys. So thank you. Thank you for being able to give me and for what you guys are able to give to my team and my department and the community that I serve. I'm an asset because of a lot of it because of you guys. So thank you guys for what you guys are able to provide me to provide to my team and my life outside of the gym. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Boom. Well, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, Leo, where should people follow you? Check out your training and uh, I mean, see you tag us and everything basically, but go on. Yeah. I'm always tagging you guys, you know, always trying to, try to put you guys out there for the word of trying to move some dirt every day. They, when I walk in here, everybody's like, oh, you're going to move dirt today. I got to move the dirt closer <laughs> all over the gyms. They already know it's the deal. It's like moving uh, dirt. Everybody here is trying to move some dirt. Some people move the spoon. Some people got a tractor. Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, it, yeah. right? no, but I'm yeah, with you, you dude. If you want to follow me, by all means, uh, I post, I have my Instagram. It's basically a training log for a lot of the stuff that I do. You're going to see a lot of outdoor stuff there. It's uh, life underscore off underscore Leo Rosa. And that's basically all I use. I'm, I'm not a Facebook guy. Uh, not, none of that. I don't have any other platforms. I'm just a you know professional bro. And go on the, on the gram and find me there if you want to follow, see some some fitness, some outdoor stuff. I show a lot of the beautiful Pacific Northwest on my hikes and adventures. I'm always outside. So if you want to get jealous with the mountains that we have here, go follow me too. 
Yeah, yeah. We, we have none. And holds the record as the only Power Athlete Radio guest to come in with a sleeveless shirt on. <laughs> All I got to say is abrigado. You know what that means? Tight later? No, that's uh, in Brazil. It's, uh, thank you. Abrigado. Oh. Arigato. Thanks, Leo. Arigato, Mr. Roboto. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Leo. Appreciate right. it. Mr. Roboto. Bye, boys. <laughs> See you.